spiritual foundation for the Christian faith. And I know that most of us have said this on Sunday, once or twice in the past, and I uh, just want to look at the scriptural basis for the creed. Basically, what we'd like to achieve during this session is understand the Christian Church, through a series of councils, came to formulate the core doctrine of faith. That doctrine includes the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's indistinguishable and incomprehensible. That is, it's beyond man's capability to understand. The early church councils draft and approved the core foundational documents, which include the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed itself is based upon a spiritual foundation, that is, things that's written in Holy Scripture uh, for the entire Christian faith. We also want to look at some of the, the variety of opinions regarding the nature of God. An Orthodox theology describes God as one and two, three forms, but there are many, many other, you know, concepts of Trinity or concepts of God, which are discussed as uh, heresies. The Articles of Religions, found back in, written back in uh, 1562, state that Holy Scripture contains all things necessary for salvation, so that whatever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, should not be required of any man that should be believed as an article of faith, or being brought requisite or necessary to salvation. In the name of the Holy Scripture, do you understand those canonical books? the Old and New Testaments, whose authority was never in doubt from the early church. And this, of course, you know, mirrors Second Timothy. All scripture is breathed out of God, profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So the Nicene Creed was formulated at the Council of Nicaea, and then put into final you know, form by the Council of Constantine. And we say that every Sunday at Mass. That's from our Catholic Church, so we say it every Sunday during our celebration. But do we take in reflection you know, what are the implications of the dogmatic theology which underlines that? In the Creed, we're not only affirming the faith, but we're condemning some of the heretical notions of the early Christians. And that's the reason why the creed itself was to derive from the uh, baptismal interrogations, before which someone was immersed in water three times, the Catechismus was asked if they believed in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when the fathers of Nicene wished to condemn Arius, one of those heresies, they couldn't have them merely recant, recite the old formations because they were too vague and allowed room for things like Gnosticism and Arianism. So they inserted phrases into them, which says here would be odious to Arius, but in the other sense, they'd be also considered heresy back in the old church, the modern church. And so what was meant to bring things together also, you know, gives us a path forward that led to some further friction, which we'll see in a minute. So let us recite together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God of God, light of light, True God from two God, we have not made. Being consubstantial with the Father, through all things were made. For us in our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate to, to the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, that though the day he rose again, the course with the scriptures. 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. He will come in glory to judge both the wicked and the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is glorious, is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess my baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the world to come. So, back in the early church, and you can see the Mediterranean basin here, and we've read quite a bit in the New Testament about what happened, you know, in Palestine and Jerusalem, Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. But at the time of Emperor Constantine, the word of God had spread to the entire, you know, what had been the former Roman Empire, which included England. And so my orientation is I'm an Anglo-Catholic, which is part of the church in England, which is there before St. Gregory sent the Pope to establish the Church of England. And by the way, the Catholic Church came to England from Ireland. So the word was there before the Bishop of Rome sent somebody out. The early church was distributed geographically by cities, and the person who was the major power authority in the city of the region was a bishop. And the bishops at that time, there was no pope. The, uh, all bishops were considered to be equals as far as doctrinal matters. And so when they had a question or were wanting to discuss heresy, they would meet in a council. And one of the councils was the Council of Nicaea. So they were scattered across this broad area, if you think about it in modern terms, and you know, there was no mass transportation, letters, you know, perilous ascent. But they communicated by letter. There was no structure above them. And so they meet periodically to decide matters of doctrine in the ecumenic councils. At the time of Constantine, 328, what you see in orange is the extent of the empire. And Christianity had also spread to the east over here in what we know as Turkey and Asia Minor now and Mesopotamia is that region also. According to Servius, most famous writing Historia Ecclesiastica, there were over 318 bishops present there. It says Pope Sylvester was a number at that time Horus of Cordonia and Constantine. There were Latin or Roman delegates, Mark of Calabria, Nicosias of Dijon, Donus of Strider and Pannonia, two Roman priests, Victor and Vincensus. Then from the Greek community, which we now know as the Greek Orthodox community, the eastern end of Byzantium, there was St. Alexander of St. Alexander of Alexandria, Eustatius of Antioch. Marcius of Jerusalem, Eusebius of Nicodema, Eusebius of Caesarizza, Nicholas of Mera, and a young deacon named Anathasis of Alexandria. And he was the author of the subsequent creed to this one, which we won't discuss in their form, but basically it says if you're not Catholic, you're not going to heaven. So, you know, it tried to clarify the. Uh, the wording of the Nicene Creed and the cause of the morphogen. So first line is, I believe in one Father, sorry, God the Father Almighty. And in scripture, we worship one God, Don I, this in Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And on the left, you see Michelangelo's interpretation of God. It says the Lord that God is God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great God Almighty, and awesome, he's the Alpha and the Omega, who is and was to come, the Almighty. The Lord of God will serve and will obey his voice. God is revealed to man in scripture, many sources. God is revealed to man by God himself. He sent us the Son to bear witness to him. 
God is revealed by man, by the Son, repeating myself, sorry. Man is, God is incomprehensible to man. He's beyond our brains to wrap around you know, who and what he is and the extent of his power. But it's still, as just as the Jews, it's our duty to worship the Lord and to know the Lord. God is unitary and triune. He is one person, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We'll talk more about that concept of the Trinity in a minute. So the doctrine of God, the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of the Lord. It's a great God, mighty and awesome. The Alpha and Omega, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. First, we understand that our duty is to know and love God. God's name is clerical and it's plural, it implies a three person Godhead and is expected of worthy. The Triune God is the name in which all of Christians are baptized with water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We worship God both in formal settings and our lives in prayer and communion with the church as a fellowship of all believers. We baptize into the church there with water in the name of the Spirit. God is revealed by God. The patristic authors wrote that Father and Son God, Father, and Son were completely equal with identical attributes. While this was debated, and that debate is reflected in the Nicene Creed, John noted that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John's text suggests three attributes of the Godhead. God the Trinity precedes creation. God the Father is the source of the Holy Spirit flows on him. The unity of God encompasses Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Basil notes that the distinctions of Godhead are functional rather than being separate entities. The order in the church and its future. So Paul introduced to us a term called the economy of God to suggest that there was disorder and confusion in the practice of the church. We clearly see that from his letters praising some churches, condemning the others under bad practices. From Trinitarian the theology, is framed in the following manner. The Father blesses man with his Son. Salvific grace comes from the Father. The fa Father offers the sin the Son as propitiation for our sins. The Father offers the Son as a blessing or active agent for salvation. And the Holy Spirit is endued in man at the day of Pentecost, which we celebrate uh, two weeks ago, to for them to receive salvation. Thus, economic salvation comes from trying to hold. Going back to the even Puritan you know, framework for conceptualization of the Father and God. God exists. God is eternal. God is immutable. God is omnipresent. He's omnificent. He's all wise. God is all powerful. He's holy, that is, without imperfection or sin. He's good, sovereign over all, and he's patient. And clearly, the people of Israel and we all trust test that patient every day. In scripture, he's referred to as the I Am. Adonai is the one true God of the Old and New Testament. Revealed to us by Jesus in scripture, we are led by the Holy Spirit, the triune entity to our salvation. Blessed is the Lamb. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. Again from John, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory and glory is only the Son of God, full of grace and truth. So from the Christ hymn, we surmise that Christ was present at the creation and represents the wisdom of God. He pre-existed with the Father. Christ, the image of God, reflects the Father and his everlasting power and divinity. Through Christ, the work of redemption will occur in us, that is, if we believe, we accept, and we follow the word. Christ is the head of the church on earth. He is a one, all-sufficient intermediary, intercessor, priest between God and man, and Christ came to reconcile God and the Father. On the right, we see three different icons, if you will. Christ, 
ruling and judgment in heaven. In the Catholic, Orthodox, and Anglican Church, we use crucifix to show Christ dying for our sins as that sacrifice or offering. And then on the bottom right, a more uh, traditional Protestant, which shows the glory of the risen Christ. But the doctrine of Christ rests with every member of the church to show forth in his life. As uh, noted in Thomas Kempis, the imitation of Christ, that we should live also in the life of Christ. But that power doesn't come from within us, it comes from above and the Holy Spirit endued in us. There is a divine influence which we may resist or thwart, but which tends if we allow us to work through, to allow him to work through us into actuality. We can't do it ourselves, it has to be God working through us. Whether we turn this power of God or the Spirit, Christ the Spirit, who is regarded by St. Paul as indifferent, and in truth is not a fourth importance. Belief, living, and following in God's path under the influence of Spirit is what Paul stressed. So Christ is the foundation of the church. We call ourselves Christians based on being followers of Jesus Christ. Son of God, our Savior, our Redeemer, and who conveyed through the laying on of hands the Holy Spirit to sinful man. Even though fully God, he emptied himself, Genesis, by taking the form of a servant, being the born the likeness of man, and even being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the Father to the point of death, even on a cross. So his death on the cross was necessary for our salvation. That was the propitiation, the offering for our death and sin. Salvador Jesus is fully divine and man's savior. He is the way, the truth, and life revealed in the synaptic gospels. He was proclaimed by John and was commemorated in the Last Supper, defined as death and resurrection. Christ is the second person of Trinity. The Word becomes flesh. The doctrine of truth is confessional, transformational, transcendent, and eternal. The divine reality of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a full and equal trinity, is revealed in Scripture and is affirmed by the Church Fathers. Jesus, as Salvador Munde, provides for our sanctification and affords us the possibility of salvation. Theatric Union, Emilio Deo, Cape Diai, these terms come from the notion provided to us in James and Corinthians that man must become Christ-like to be redeemed. He served as the bridge between the Father and man, and can only aspire to Jesus' state of perfect union with the Father. Salvation requires a man to grow in process, to lead a godly life, as Jesus did. With Christ providing the kappa di, man as an advocate of the Father, and again is afforded the possibility of a full redemption. This is a process, not a once in time deal. One has to believe, be baptized, accept Christ as a Savior, and the propitiation for our sins, and then walk as Paul instructed his wayward communities in his footsteps. Jesus is also the great high priest in the sense that both traditional and evangelical centers, he was chosen from the people. He was called by God for his mission. He was appointed to offer sacrifices and gifts to God for sin. From a Trinitarian point of view, Jesus and the Holy Spirit is the intercessor of the Father. Jesus is present within the church millennium, us as the members of the living body of Christ. We are invited to imitate his life and mission through worship and prayer, through his blood and the sacrament of communion or the institute the ordinance of communion. And in this cup, we all become equal members of the community, of the churches, of the community of the faithful. He's also a judge. That was the icon of Jesus on the throne. And the day of the Lord Jesus Christ will be the judge, the omnipotent being having all power in heaven and earth, an absolute deity being God over all. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
this is where things get very confusing. I had a colleague in my Episcopal Education for Ministry who couldn't understand the spirit. He was a scientist, so he understood water could have three forms, but he had a hard time seeing that God could have three forms. So the creed says we believe in the Father, Son, and the giver of life. Pneumology has debated these terms for 2,000 years. Catholic Orthodox and Reformed traditions from Acts come to different conclusions or different understandings of what this means. As Jesus witnessed and blessed the, the apostles with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit also binds the faithful to Christ and the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Communion, Lord's Supper. Both Baptists and the Eucharist witness the union between the Spirit and the faithful. Scripture shows us that the Holy Spirit speaks to us and works through us. Pneumology hasn't received the emphasis or as some theologians as Christology because it's not simple. It's a hard concept to get one's head around. And that's why the diagram uh, on the right was put together. Peter, Jesus, Spiritus, Sanctus, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And it's an inner relationship. In modern terms, we call this thing a Venn diagram. And it's meant to show that there's this one being that intersects all of these three people, three entities. All stress, all Christians stress that the Holy Spirit is effective agent of man's salvation through the process called assurance of salvation. Authors such as Burgess stress the need for the believer's faith and need to sense God's love in the heart through the Spirit. The Spirit is the author, not us, of our proofs of true holiness. Goodwin, no relation, stresses the need to live in love and communion with the triune God, and stresses also the dynamic interaction between Christ and Christ in man's salvation, the need for the Spirit's indwelling presence, again brought to the apostles and given to us, brought to the apostles of Pentecost and given to us through laid on hands. All agree that faith with divine help leads to assurance. Christians are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before receiving the sacrament of baptism, they respond to a three-part question. They're asked to confess this Catholic tradition. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the simple answer is, I do. The faith of all Christians rests on our belief in the Trinity. Traditional doctrine of the Holy Spirit from Roman Catholic, the Holy Ghost is third person of the Blessed Trinity. Though distinct as a person, the Father and Son is consubstantial with them, the means of being the same nature and kind. He possesses with them the same essence or nature. It proceeds not by way of generation, but by way of spiration from the Father and the Son, together from a single principle. That's probably written by Aquinas, a little awkward off the tongues. Greek Orthodox Church stresses more the mystery. Again, we're not meant to understand things. They state the Holy Spirit is holy God and proceeds from the Father. The Spirit is sent from the Father into the world for Jesus so that we can be anointed as the children of God, Christ-like so we can be saved. A person can abide in Christ, accomplish his commandments, and be communion with God the Father only through the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. Spiritual life is life is in and by the Holy Spirit. We also call it modern age by works. So the great schism was nominally, you know, attributed to the Philippic cause, you know, the night uh, nice increase. That's that the son proceeds from the father. That there's great similarity between you know, the Roman Orthodox and Anglican tradition. We all believe pretty much in the literal interpretation of the Nicene Creed. Now, post reservation in the, uh, uh, the modern era and the postmodern era, we get, let's call it a smorgasbord of, of choices. Uh, one author that was assigned to us, Barclay, came up with the laundry list here. Cinderella Trinity, three elements that don't have any presence, says there's no place for a third, you know, third place in triangle. 
Pneumology is subordinate Christology, which is more important. Understanding Christ, understanding spirit. Um, some theologians say that we more focus on Christ and our spirit, and therefore we need to re-examine that and make sure that we look equally to spirit you know, as a factor along with Christ as a church. So, in the significance of spirit and role today, scholars also want to include anthropology, redemption, salvation through the indwelling, indwelling works of the spirit, and the authority of the church as the body of believers. Christian spirituality is not unique to spirituality is not unique to Christianity, but the union of human spirituality with the Holy Spirit is leading to salvation as one could argue that's not a lot different than what the Indians believe when they talk about Mother Earth. I don't think that's what the intent is. The spirit and the imagination in human being, that spirit's in the medium of the imagination, enabling man to understand scripture and sacraments as well to be creative. Well, that's not what scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that the Father is revealed through the Son and then is in our life to show us the road to salvation. The spirit and renewal of echo theology. Given the creation of all things by God, then the spirit can provide healing for man's ecological follies. This and the next one, kind of our new wave, new generation, trying to take scripture and spin it to you know, a current political agenda. So spirit and feminist theology. In order to balance the you know, references to God the Father, feminist theologian proposed considering that the spirit is feminine. Well, wisdom from the Old Testament was stated to be a feminine entity, you know, sent by God to help people understand. But, you know, saying, uh, describing characteristics to the Godhead that aren't in Scripture just seems a little bit too far revisionist. Science and religion, dialogue and media. Both Boltman and Pannenberg suggest that theology includes science. The spirit is the bridge between theology and science. And in tradition, one accepts scripture, tradition, and common sense. And so those things all go together. It does not mean that theology should be replaced with scientific humanism. It just means that natural law is a subset of God's law that we've got to understand either. So we talk about one holy Catholic and apostolic church. This is things where it get uh, really confusing. My graphic down here is intended to show you that things have split up a bit. This is the Great Schism. Rome Church continues. The uh, Orthodox Church continues. And then the Anglicans got put up here. Actually, most Anglicans consider themselves most Anglo-Catholics consider themselves self-Catholic, not reform. They didn't believe the power of the Pope, so they should be a lot, a lot parallel to this. But then you're all quite aware that there's at least um, maybe 10 different, 10,000 different flavors of Protestant tradition. So in theory, we're one church, the body of believers in sacramental union through baptism, and you're in sharing the Eucharistic uh, body and blood of Christ. We're unified in Jesus Christ and dwelling in the Holy Spirit. And we're renewed by Jesus Christ in the Holy Communion. This is my body, this is my blood. The church is the community of the faithful, the saints, the coetis, the electorum, acting in consort with, under the Spirit. We're a holy church because we worship together to glorify God. So the church on earth, the church militant, the ecclesia, are members of the body of Jesus Christ, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that we can pro proclaim his excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into the light. You are God's people. So that was the second covenant. First was with the people of Israel. They didn't listen. Jesus came, redeemed all people. And that's why Paul became a mission to the Gent a mission apostle to the Gentiles. We're Catholic. Catholic in two sentences. Catholic with a big C, Catholic with a little C. It's the universal church that encompasses all people of all nations brought together by God's word to hear the gospel, take communion and worship the living God. 
and a core doctrine that guides faithful to revealing scripture by the Son and the Spirit. Apostolic, the Nicene, Nicene Creed, reflects the fourfold presses of the church going to apostolic doctrine, the comedy of the faithful, unifying sacraments, and common worship. The Father calls the community of the faithful, the Son is the head of the church, and the Spirit unites, unites the community. While commission and share the gospel, all corners of earth are mandate established, does not establish a okay, physical church, ecclesiastical. Sorry, it establishes a physical church, but not a hierarchical relationship with her outfalls in the early church. So there's thousands of ways that ways and entities that call themselves churches, which may or may not be scripturally you know, grounded. In the big C tradition, Roman Orthodox and Anglican tradition, we assert a trifold ministry that was traced back to the apostles when the apostles laid their hands on people and uh, go back and look at Acts 17, 19. So it's not just being baptized, but it's this dwelling the spirit that's endued into the bishops, presbyter, elders, uh, we give choice of terms, you know, that through the laying on the hands. So you're baptized into the church, you become members, but then you become leaders or the apostolic succession through the laying on the hands, going back to the original uh, apostles. More simple, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Again, as Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Baptism is the entry into the Christian life. It's the gateway to life in the spirit and the door which gives access to other sacraments. In baptism, we're freed from sin and reborn. I say again, we're reborn as sons of God. We become members of Christ incorporated into the church and made sharers in admission. Baptism is the sacrament of regeneration through the water and the word. This was invoked in baptism, the role of the spirits to build and uplift the Christian community, the community. The Spirit was imparted at Pentecost upon the, the apostles, the early disciples, to encompass the entire church united as Christ, as one Lord, one faith, one vassal. Yet the Spirit is not just to build the church, it's also a gift from God to each and one, every one of us by the Son to allow an indwelling helper to facilitate our individual and collective salvation. Man is born in sin, it's called uh, original sin. Man's sin opens and closes the Bible before Eden. Man uh, lived presumably forever until his eyes was opened until temptation there and temptation is followed through the ages. But once man chose to be knowledgeable, they and their progeny were burdened with sin. So only Jesus can save us from this thing. And again, quoting him, he says, I am the direction of life. He who believes in me, though he may die, she shall live. Whoever lives in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He asked his disciples. And some didn't until after he was raised from the dead. I am the way and the life and the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in summary, a state of spiritual blessedness the believer experiences salvation in Christ. Belief in Christ the only means for our salvation. In baptism, from the near the beginning, the apostolic tradition includes baptizing with water in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Christian theology, all flavors of it, have universally accepted baptism and celebration and treated community of people. Uh, in baptism, original sin is remitted, a new life is received, and holiness is endued. One of the debates is, you know, the age of uh, accountability. You know, we baptize infants, and you reaffirm your faith. The vows that were made for you in uh, confirmation, Roman Catholics do first baptism, sorry, first communion. But we are all saved by being baptized. Jesus instituted two sacraments, or ordinances, if you will, as signs of Christian mystery as being necessary for salvation. 
The first we talked about is baptism. The second is the Lord's Supper. It's a mystery of the carious atonement, the remission of our sins. We sin, we confess our sins, we're going to sin again, we go and we repartake of Jesus' body and blood. To the sins are since early Christian times, the word Eucharist from the Greek Eucharista was used to describe the sacrament of Jesus to the Last Supper. While there's four accounts, there's minor variations, all agree that on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus met with his disciples for the Last Supper. As a solemn ritual act, thank to his tradition, Jesus spoke with the bread of his body and the wine of his blood of the New Covenant. The Old Covenant was with the tribes of Israel. The New Covenant is with each and every one of us. In the earliest written account, Paul's, uh, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians and the new disciples were instructed to continue his right quote in remembrance of him. Now you're all quite aware there's probably about 15 different interpretations of what that means, ranging from St. Williamson says we're just doing it as a memory supper to the Roman Catholic transubstantiation, which means the body of blood become that of uh, of Jesus. The Anglican Orthodox Church is more uh, different from that. Let's say it's, it's a spiritual real presence. God is there in spirit, not physical. So the element of the celebration of Eucharist though, is regarded as an essential part of worship in the old church and it's remained central to the church ever since. With few exceptions, everybody reads the observation of the sacrament as a divine obligation. And some think it's just for moral service we do this because we did that. It does say red and white, and I won't get into that debate. Despite differences in interpretations of variance in manner and frequency, Jesus said, do this in reminds me. It's been made by Christians of every tradition throughout the centuries. Thus the Eucharist remains a central in universal expression of devotion. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which is also for the life of the world. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye shall have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh, and drinks my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. Pretty straightforward. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So this was something that was debated back in scripture. You know, how is man to be born again? We are born again. We are the resurrection of life. Because those who believe in Jesus, though die, will live. I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Our life in sin, atonement for sin, and everlasting life, the possibility of everlasting life, stem from our belief and from the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Christ is died, Christ is rising, Christ will come again. The Father offers glory and reward, resurrection, contingent on the Son's atonement for all our sins. Jesus, as the prophet outlined, man's path to salvation and endues us with the Holy Spirit. As our divine high priest, he offers atoning sacrifice for reconciliation and intercession. The Spirit flows from the Father through the Son to guide our reconciliation. There's the kingdom that we're familiar with, the church militant. This kingdom is built on Jesus Christ as God incarnate living on earth in human form. Jesus' new exodus from bondage forms a divine kingdom of all nations. The critical element of this is the Holy Spirit who remains after Jesus' resurrection. Man received the Spirit at the Festival of Pentecost. Again, a couple weeks ago, we celebrate that. Jesus commissioned all believers to share the gospel to all nations. This is known as the Great Commission. The extended, this extended God's promise from the tribe of Israel, all Abraham's seeds, be blessed, and also to the Gentiles, Gentiles, who will now join the family of David through Christ. 
as he is his brothers and sisters, we are elevated to join him in judging alone. Jesus' incarnation and arguing with him fulfill God's design that we are united in the divine family. This also requires that we God's soldiers in fighting evil. The United Kingdom has been initiated, but is not fulfilled. Again, church militant. We're fighting the fight in a very secular world, so God can triumph in the end. The kingdom not yet. The Old Testament promise of Messiah to redeem, to redeem and unite God's wayward children. And that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Some felt that this was supposed to be a military person to take over, create a secular Christian, a secular kingdom. But it turns out that that was not the plan. The plan was to create a heavenly kingdom that we look forward to. So the promise of future success foretold in Daniel. The final plan is found in Revelation. There is, as one of our professors minored, ongoing spiritual warfare. The battle between good and evil is spiritual and physical. Those who uh, have left the chosen land are overcome. Their sins were paid for by Jesus. Not Jesus is a worldly king, as some might have expected. So Armageddon will come to follow the Lord's day, and God will return to judge. We can save the quick and the dead. So, and then this will establish the new Jerusalem and Christ's earthly dominion. God will return to dwell with his people. So what does salvation mean? So man's salvation, which is unmarried and only comes to us through Jesus Christ, flows from Jesus Christ being born, being crucified, and raised again. It requires Jesus' mentorial offices. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, and that is Jesus Christ. The Father offers glory and reward, continuing on person's atonement for all sin, and the Son's atonement for the all sin. Jesus serves as a prophet that outlines our path to salvation and endued us with the Holy Spirit because we can't do it our own. The carious atonement in Hebrew tradition, if you violate the law, you had to confess it, you had to pay punishment and retribution. So violation of God's law we call sin, and thus sin requires retribution. Jesus offered his son as the carrier's atonement for all our sins, representation for all our sins. Regeneration means being born again in Jesus Christ. It's called an effectual calling, it requires conviction of conscience, elimination of understanding, renovation of the will, faith in Jesus' atonement, and restores man's union to the Father through the Son, again, with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Conversion. You'd have to be a believer in order to be saved. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So being born again is the essence of Christian salvation. It starts with conversion. Conversion itself requires faith and repentance. Justification, job, God absolves our sins and accepts us as righteous through Christ by faith. In Reformed theology, justification is based on faith, solely to be earned by Christ, is instantaneous and complete, an all encompassing act of God, affords external life and precedes sanctification. It is a not once and done deal, though. It's we're instructed to walk in Christ's path. Sanctification is that process which we uh, have to follow to, as I mentioned earlier, Thomas Kempis, Imitation of Christ, where it's spotted to walk in his words to show our faith. Under the agency of spirit to strengthen faith, includes our whole being, is gradual, is reflected both internally and externally, and is incomplete in this life which means we're all brothers and sisters and working partners. And this is all only afforded by the means of grace. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing, but it's a gift from God, a very precious one. So let us conclude by saying together, if you don't mind, the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God of God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, come substantial with the Father, through him all things are made. For us men in our salvation, he came from heaven by the Holy Ghost and was incarnate in the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom shall have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds with the Father and Son, who with the Father and Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for forgiveness of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the body and life of the world to come. Amen. God bless you, and I hope to hear from you.